originally it started nine years ago. Uh, I was uh, traveling in Argentina on vacation, um, and and when I was there, I was noticing I was there for about a month that there were many children uh, in the streets and in different areas uh, walking around barefoot and in conditions that you wouldn't want to be barefoot. So it was not by choice, I could tell. Uh, and then later in my trip, I, I met some women that were doing some volunteer work. And when I asked them about what they were doing, uh, we were chatting in this cafe, they, sp they said that they were um, doing something called a shoe drive. And what that meant was they were collecting slightly used shoes uh, to give to children in some of the uh, towns outside of Buenos Aires um, because in those towns the children were required to wear a uniform to school and part of the uniform was a pair of shoes and the shoes was the most expensive part of the uniform and many of the families could not afford the shoes. Especially as kids feet grow so quickly that you're con constantly having to buy new pairs. Exactly and so what we, what we found was there were children that desperately wanted to go to school but they were not able to because they didn't have the proper Proper shoes and to me that just seemed ridiculous you know and so um, I got to know these women and, and they invited me to come with them and I went and had this great experience uh, giving shoes that day is so joyful and the, and the kids were so happy I mean you would have thought it was it was Christmas Day it was amazing but um, but, but what I, my question was and my concern was is the sustainability of the program when it was based on charity, based on donations. Because the only way that, we, that they could continue to give shoes to the kids that needed them every you know, four or five months as their feet grew was to get another donation. And that didn't seem very dependable. So my background um, you know, has always been as an entrepreneur. I started my first company when I was 19. And so before easy I laundry, easy laundry, man. Yeah. Oh, I He's, mean, yeah, okay, Bill Clinton thanks. has nothing on you. Look at that. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I will just point out that Blake did. You launched like really mega companies before you did Tom's. You are a, you are a social entrepreneur, but you are an entrepreneur. That is correct. Fundamentally. I love the idea of using business to solve problems. Before Tom's, the problems I solved were, were had nothing to do with charity or, or a social aspect. They were just just everyday business and consumer problems. But um, but yeah. So, so when I saw this, this problem of children not having shoes to go to school, my mind thought about entrepreneurship, not about charity. And I think a lot of people have asked me and said, that seems like such a crazy idea or, 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 or you know, that was so disruptive or these, thing, these words they've used to describe it. But to me, it was actually very simple, very natural, and, and, it, and, and, and very commonsensical. And the, the way it was is like, if I can afford to buy a pair of shoes, how great would it be to be able to buy a pair of shoes and give a pair of shoes? I mean, it's you know not not rocket science. Like you buy a pair, you give a pair. You you can afford it. Someone else can't. So now you're helping someone at the same time. And so it was it was really a very simple idea. It was to help 250 kids in one town in Argentina um, nine years ago, and um, you know it took off. So um, you, I think the thing I like to talk about with people, you know, is that is it, it, even if it would have only stayed a simple idea in terms of only helping 250 kids every time, you know, for their whole school year, uh, it still would have been worth the idea, you know? So sometimes ideas become big things and sometimes they stay small, but if, if your intent is to help someone and to make the world a better place through your idea, it, it shouldn't be measured in, in how big it becomes. It should be measured more in the intent. And I think that, you know, uh, as I look back, I had no idea that Tom's would become what it's become today, and I'm super thankful, and I feel very blessed, and I love what we get to do. But I, I often like to state that it, it, the idea itself was, uh, you know, would have been fine if it stayed small. Because not everyone's going to have an idea that becomes massive, you know, but everyone can have an idea that can make a small difference in their community and take great joy in that and, and, and have that be a big part of their life. And like you said, if you, if you kind of ascertain a need and you can fulfill that need, it doesn't matter whether that's to one person or a million, yes. you're still helping in some way. Because the most important thing is the one person. You know, okay. And that's why I really like to focus on the, the, the concept of one for one. And this will go to some of the other products that we're in now, is it's about one person purchasing something uh, and helping another one person around the world. And that's the one for one. 
So we started with shoes and today we've actually given away 38 million pairs of shoes. So Really? 38 million? Yeah. Amazing. So a little bit more than the 250 amazing. we started with. Okay, amazing. Um, but we've also expanded into eyewear. So we do uh, sunglasses and optical frames. And when you buy a pair of our frames, uh, we help provide someone a sight. So we pay for cataract surgeries for people who are blind. We give prescription glasses to children who need them to see the chalkboard and can't afford the eye exam and the glasses. Right, because as we know in the, in the, in the developed world, it's a very, very obvious and simple thing that we go to the optician and get glasses. Many people can't afford that and that actually classes them as disabled. I mean, if you're, exactly. you can't farm, you can't learn, you can't do anything if you can't see. It's one of the, one of the saddest things is when you're in a place, uh, you know, I actually uh, was in Nepal. Uh, yeah. many years ago and and in seeing kids in the classroom that were being treated as if they were disabled but all they were is they just couldn't see the chalkboard right. and so just a simple pair of glasses literally changed someone's life and we work with this amazing uh, eye doctor named Chunduk who works with this organization called Seva who we do a lot of work with I will and just say on that I taught at a school in Kathmandu for three months when I left school. Oh, we did. And all we all we are then we we lived with the headmaster for three months in Kathmandu. But all we said is there anything we can do, anything we can bring. He said, please bring spectacles. Get any old spectacles you can. Please bring spectacles. And that's how important it was to that country. And I don't think I then even realized how blessed I was that at whatever age, age ten, I just went to an optician and was able to see. It's a huge thing. I mean, thing. it's huge. I mean, it's it's everything. I mean, if you can't see and you don't have a way to to improve upon that, then your your life prospect is so limited. And so, um, so we work with these organizations, you know, to be able to do that through the sale of our glasses. And I love the fact on the on the glasses side point is that you know obviously it's something you wear every day, and so it becomes a part of your identity. But it also becomes a part of your identity that you chose a very specific pair of glasses, a specific pair of Toms, because you know that you're able to help someone see that wouldn't be able to so we've used the one for one to move into that um, how do you how do you choose which countries you work with how that must be very hard because everybody needs that well you know it, it, our whole model is really dependent on the NGO community globally so the non-government organizations and nonprofits that are serving in countries whether it's helping with vaccinations uh, malaria nets um, helping build education you know schools uh, clean water systems these NGOs are kind of addressing the biggest global needs and we partner with them to help distribute our shoes because what we learned very early on was it was really important that our shoes were integrated into the other work that the community is doing. It does, it's, it's really not good just to, just to give stuff. You know, that's really important. When you really learn about the way to do proper aid and do it in a sustainable and responsible way, it's all about integrating into the whole community efforts that UNICEF or Save the Children or one of these big global organizations is doing. So, so we, um, we really focus a lot on working with those partners and they help guide us as to where we need to give shoes or where we need to help with glasses or you know, now that we're in maternal health, where we work in that. So it's really important that the NGOs and the nonprofits are a critical piece to the kind of Tom's ecosystem. And if you're a Tom's customer, they're a critical piece to the delivery mechanism that the shoes or the eye care is getting to the people that need it the most. Um, and the other thing that's so great about working with them is we create thousands of local jobs because you know they all hire locals to help with the distribution of our shoes and different and different aspects. And then we pay them a fee on top of giving them the shoes to be able to fund that. So we're actually creating thousands of local jobs in each of these communities we give in 65 countries now through the NGOs that we work with. It's amazing, it's amazing. Okay, and then after the eyewear, you then launched Tom's Roasting Company, yep. Co, yeah. which is coffee. Yes. And so one bag of coffee, if you buy one bag of Tom's coffee, you're supplying clean water to one person for a whole week, right? Yep, absolutely. And that, um, and that's in you, the, 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 that's in the countries that you grow the coffee beans in. Exactly. So a big, big focus for Tom's over the past few years has been to move from an organization that is largely known for providing aid, but to also be creating jobs. Um, if you look at poverty alleviation, uh, you know the three things that are, are critical are first and foremost basic needs being met. So that's clean water, food, shelter, shoes health needs. Second is education, you know, getting everyone in school, especially girls, very, very important for any community development. 
And third is job creation. And so, you know, we very early on uh, only focused on aid. Uh, then we actually received some criticism for that because many people were saying, you know, we really think that your organization, if any organization, should be using local manufacturing to create jobs. And so we really listened to the critics and we changed our model. And now we have manufacturing in uh, India, Kenya, Ethiopia. And actually last year we opened a, a factory in Haiti. And we're the only people making shoes in Haiti today, um, which is really cool because um, many of these people who are working in our Haiti factory lost their jobs after the earthquake, and now they have employment again, and they're very proud, and they're doing a great job. And, and so that's a big part of our future. And the reason I bring that up is that actually led us into the coffee business of all places. Because as I was learning about um, creating local jobs and, 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 and economic development, I kept hearing about the coffee industry as being one of the greatest industries in places that we're giving our shoes. Guatemala, Honduras, Malawi, Rwanda, Ethiopia. These places are where the greatest coffee in the world comes from. But unfortunately, a lot of times the coffee growers, the farmers themselves, they are having to sell their beans to this export company that makes most of the profit in the sale of the coffee to then to all the big mass coffee chains. But if you can go directly to the farmers themselves or to the co-ops, and they call it direct trade, it actually allows the farmers to make a, a significant amount more in, in, in income. Therefore, they can have a higher quality of life. So by us getting into the coffee space, we're able to not only help uh, the farmers make more money by trading directly with them and their co-ops, but then also our, our one for one in coffee is you buy our coffee, we give water because water is the number one ingredient used in making coffee and in places like Malawi, Rwanda, Guatemala, Ethiopia, unfortunately uh, clean water is a scarcity. And so making sure that, that we are investing in those communities by providing clean water systems, we're ensuring a better and safer life for them and also we're protecting the coffee industry in, in the years to come. So a lot of people said, you know, especially a lot of the people that you interview uh, in the fashion space okay said okay this guy did shoes and now he's doing eyewear get it get it coffee what the hell is that all about you know because it, it seems so random to go from these accessories to coffee but if you think about it in the context of creating jobs and economic development having an impact in these communities it actually makes a lot of sense I also know with your book start something that matters you I said that for every book sold you would then donate books as well so you're also in the in the literary literature we, and we have and it's so fun because my favorite book uh, is uh, this Dr. Seuss book called The Places You Will Go. Uh, we actually had people in our wedding in the audience recite different lines. We like it so much. Um, but it was great because the, the, the organization we partnered with on the giving books once I sold my book, um, they had the Dr. Seuss titles. So I've been able to go to a lot of the schools and get to read this book and let all the kids get Dr. Seuss books. Your book is very cult because if I kind of search you up on social media, it's amazing how many people just Instagram that book, that book, that book, because it represents that they're, it's like everything, that it represents something that they believe in what you're doing, but that they're also learning. And I think that that's what you're, what is so interesting and important about you is that you're not just doing it, you're also sharing your experience. Absolutely. And I think that that's really important, not only to the people in this country, but, but to the people who you're giving shoes to. It's not just giving shoes, you're actually inspiring entrepreneurship and learning and I think it's really important I just I want to we're going to take a quick quick look at what you've recently launched which is do you want to talk actually let's sure. watch it first we've, and then we'll talk about it with the bags Tom's okay. bags yeah Tom's bags okay you know the thing that is interesting about us getting into the bag business is you know going back to shoes and eyewear both being accessories many of our retailers said you know we we're doing so well with your shoes and your eyewear we think you should guys should should do a, uh, some casual handbags you know totes backpacks these types of things and i remember first hearing that from our retailers and saying well yeah we could probably sell lots of bags but it's not really a clear one for one it's not like we're going to sell a bag give a bag like the world doesn't need more bags and so we actually put the idea on hold for quite a bit of time. It had been a couple of years since our retailers had asked us to do bags. And it wasn't until someone in our giving group, um, which we have this amazing group at Tom's that all they do is focus on you know, giving every day, which is incredible to think for a for-profit business that there's 35 people in LA that just scrutinize how we give, where we give, you know, how better to give. 
But one of the people in the giving group, you know, came to me and said, you know what, I think I have a way that we can really, you know, um, maximize the commercial opportunity in bags because um, in, in, in many places around the world, you know, women are giving birth in their homes and in many developing countries are giving birth in their homes in areas that are not very sterile and not very safe for giving birth. And so we've heard about these UN health workers that distribute these birth kits that come in a bag. And so I said, perfect, now we have our bag for bag. So we'll sell a bag, but we'll give a bag that contains a birth kit. And what a birth kit is, is it's very simple uh, you know, necessities for giving a safe birth in your home, whether you have a midwife or you have a friend or a family member helping you. So it's a drapery that goes on the ground, so then now it's sterile. It's the uh, tool to cut the umbilical cord, which is really important because oftentimes when they're cutting that with something that's not sterile, they get infection, which leads unfortunately to horrible things, even death for the mom or the child. Uh, the, you know, the gloves, all the different materials, um, needed to give a safe birth. And these birth kits, as simple as they are, they reduce maternal and infant mortality by 80%. I mean, it's a huge lifesaver. I mean, and that, com and in addition to the education that comes with it and training the midwives uh, is, a, is a really big deal. So someone can buy a simple, you know, tote for, you know, $75 and, and, and that birth kit could save someone's life. It's amazing. It's, it's really, really amazing. Cool. And working with Christy, I don't know if you know her or not, but I mean, she's an amazing woman. Um, Every Mother Counts, the organization that she started uh, is, is really a leader in maternal health. And Christy and I went to Haiti together and I really learned a lot about maternal health through Christy and her organization. So it was great to partner with them for the launch of this. Okay, well, I'm long may it continue. When you were first starting all of this, I just wanna go and ask you about your, the, because you know, everyone has an initiative, but you've turned an initiative into a brand, a global brand. Yeah. So when you had all these original ideas and that you've built and you've grown and you've grown and you've grown, how did this actually get off the ground in the very beginning? I remember hearing something about when Anna Winter called you American Girl called that's you. That's right. Uh, Can you, you know, if, if I'm a young Anna. entrepreneur and I want to start <laughs> something, how important is, is it is press for you and how important is it for you to market yourself? Well, I mean, the great thing about, and I didn't, I wish I was, I, I could say I was like smart enough to realize this was a strategy, but I wasn't. I just, it turned out to, in hindsight, to see this is a great strategy, is what we had and what, what allowed us to break through and to really take an initiative and turn it into a global brand and what we still have today and what we focus the most on is exactly what you and I are doing today and that is the power of story. You know, and I talk a lot about this in my book, but you know, when I started Tom's and the, and the interns and, and young people that I kind of gathered together to help me, um, you know, all we really had was a, a, a pretty amazing story. We didn't really realize it was amazing, but it was, you know, this idea of like, meeting some kids that needed shoes in Argentina and all of a sudden selling shoes and giving shoes and, and it was this very kind of radical idea that a fashion company would sell something and then give something away every time they sell it. And that was a story that kind of captivated people like Anna Wintour at Vogue and other people at you know the, some of the big department stores in America because they just hadn't heard of anything like that. And I think what fashion often is um, is, is, is known for and prides itself on is very disruptive ideas, you know? Um, so the, the designers that break out are creating something disruptive, uh, radical, something new, a fresh perspective. And so we did it in a very different way, not necessarily like our design was really radical, it was actually very simple, uh, incredibly simple, um, which I think that is, 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 is so surreal to be sitting here in the Apple store thinking about how much I looked up to, you know, the design of Apple, you know, creating such elegance out of simplicity. And so that's what the original shoe, the Tom's Classic, uh, is something I pride myself because I felt like it was the most simple piece of footwear ever because it was just literally a simple canvas draped over, you know, the sole, no laces, no, nothing else. Um, so I always used to think about Apple when I was doing design in the early days. So it's very surreal to be sitting here now, nine years later, uh, in a store giving a talk. So I'm just gonna take a moment now, look around and enjoy that, because if you don't do that, then um, you'll go by too fast. Um, but, but I really think that you know the, the, the ability to tell a story and to communicate a story that was um, very approachable for people. You know, I had no experience in footwear, no experience in retail, 
frankly didn't even know who Anna was until I got the phone call um, because I had never read a Vogue magazine. And, uh, and, 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 and so it was easy for people to say, gosh, this is a guy that saw something that was, you know, some kids that needed help and he did something about it. He made these shoes, you know, we made them in people's garages in Argentina and, and now he's helping people and I could do that too. And I think that's that story is, was able, a story that people were able to spread through YouTube and social media and everything. And that's what allowed the Tom's idea to be, become much bigger than just a simple initiative and actually become this, this brand that it's become today. And, and the Vogue shoe, I, I mean, I, whatever, I researched you, but someone at Vogue rang you up and you're like, yeah, I'll do a shoot thinking it will take you half an hour before you went for lunch with your friend. <laughs> and then like was, seven hours later, you were still doing the shoot. Yeah, so I, 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 it, was, it, was, it was my very first photo shoot. Um, and it was for Vogue, which is pretty amazing. And they said, yeah, they said, uh, you know, the shoot, we need you to meet you, meet you in Venice on Abbott Kinney uh, at, uh, I think it was 1030. And so I said, okay, great. So I said, I told my buddy I would have lunch with him at noon because I thought, you know, take an hour and then I'll get to lunch. And like seven hours later, they'd given me haircuts. They had changed my clothes 10 times. They had taken pictures all over. And they only used one picture. One. I was like, I, man. Right. They only, this is what I yeah. wrote. They only use one. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. But that had an impact, right? So I, because, yes. you, because you it were did. an example, I, I was surprised to learn that it really had an impact. So you'd had however many shoes already in your warehouse to go. And then the Vogue article ran. And then suddenly you had orders, not only from individuals, but from stores, websites. So there is power in press, and you're it, an example of that. There is, and I think what's exciting is, is that there's, there's, there's more opportunities to get a story out today than ever before. Back then, nine years ago, it was more the, the, the traditional media, and, and even in the, in the traditional media, only in the print form. Now, you know, I mean, this, this podcast that we're doing now, will hopefully will be heard by thousands, maybe millions of people someday, and they can learn from that. And, and, uh, and grow from that. And I think that's what's so exciting right now about being an entrepreneur and I'm investing in a bunch of social entrepreneurs now. And when I talk to them, I say the great thing is like, there, it's not just the big companies now that can get a message across. It's really the best message, the best stories rise to the top and get spread the most. And I think that's what's you know, so exciting about the time that we're living in right now. Um, but, you know, that, that Vogue article and, and other articles led to more people talking about it. But the, the, the main reason that Tom's grew the fastest it did, it, I, I don't believe that it was any of the traditional media, and it was that the fact that our customers internalized, own, and celebrated the giving that they were doing. And they were the ones that would share the story. So when you were wearing your first pair of Toms, and, and I'm sure that you were one of the first people wearing them, someone said, you know, uh, you know, they said, you know, you know, Kenvar, what, what are those shoes? You would never just say Toms. You would say, Toms, have you heard about this company? When they sell a pair of shoes, they give a pair of shoes. I mean, this is what, this is what you, would, you would have done, I, I presume, right? And, I, and anyone in the audience who's worn Toms, I'm, I'm sure that you've shared the story. So you're not just helping one child when you buy a pair of shoes, but you're helping many more for every time you shared the story. And, and I had many experiences in the early days of meeting people in different places, you know, and, and hearing their Tom story, and they would tell me the story, sometimes not even knowing who I was, and it was such a delight. And so I think that's really the power of, of, of what we tapped into, was that, that people, I think, as human beings, want to do good. They want to help one another. Um, sometimes it's hard, so we made it easy, but then we also made it easy for them to share what they had done by wearing it and talking about it. Okay, and you as a brand and you as a huge, an individual are very good at sharing the story. So how did you go about sit, sitting down and you thinking, I think that video is going to be really important for me. I think social media is going to be really important for me because you're really, really good at that. As a brand, the signature, the communication you have, not only with your customers, but with, with the kind of brand identity for me is, is exceptional. And I work with companies all the time who don't always get it right. Is that, your, um, is that up to you? Is that down to you? Is that your vision? Or have you got really smart people working for you? Because they say, don't employ people who can do what you do. Employ people who can do something different from what well, you do. Well, A, I have a lot of, not just smart people, but smarter people than me working for me. So that's a given, or we okay, would never and that, be here. Right, that's, um, so that's a, a real key, right? <laughs> that is a key. Yeah. I will say on the social media and the video and that stuff, 
it was actually the fact that we had no money and that was the cheapest way to get our story out. Or it was actually free. I mean, that was a beautiful thing about YouTube and some of the early things is, you know, especially Facebook in the early days before all the advertising, you could communicate with so many people and, and not and it was really your time. I mean, I remember for hours every night responding to people's posts and this and that and it was so much a part of just the way it was our only vehicle to do it because we didn't have money for advertising and promotions and events and these things. So, so, but as we've grown and as it's become a little bit of a blend between more of art and science because, you know, social media is a big business now and it is a true medium in which your brands are building their message, you know, I think we have a group of incredibly talented young people at Tom's that are living and breathing all these different, you know, uh, vehicles and they're, and, they're got, and they're actually helping me understand which ones make the most sense, you know, which ones are the most authentic. So for instance, I mainly use Instagram, and that's because it's authentic, it's easy for me to do. Now now I have a baby, so most of my Instagrams are my baby, so it's probably not as interesting to social entrepreneurs as it is to maybe uh, <laughs> my parents. But, um, so, um, but, but I promise I'm going to get back to in posting some really inspiring stuff besides my five-month-old. But, um, but, but, you know, I think that was one of the great things is for a while I was trying to kind of use all these platforms, and I really wasn't really excited about it but and then I but I love posting fun pictures of places and travels and partners and stuff and so one of the smart people on our team said you know that's the most authentic way for you to show up in social media now there's other ways you know through LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook that as a company we really show up but you yourself should just do the one that you feel the most um, you'll do the most spontaneous because that's what people really engage in when it's real. Okay, and how do you engage? You're traveling so much, so you have to engage with your company. How do you engage with the recipients of your kindness? So the great thing is, is that um, you know I have really never been running the day to day of Tom's. I've always had amazing teams at Tom's. You know, kind of in LA, running the you know keeping the train on the tracks, and and that's allowed me the freedom to be out sharing the story, m visiting our giving partners. You know, I try to go on two trips a year, usually one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, and, you know, last, last fall before we had the baby, I went to Haiti and I got to not only meet the factory workers, but then go on a shoe giving experience and then also travel around and kind of explore Haiti in a, in a, in a, in a more intimate way than I ever had before. Um, the year before that, I was in Rwanda meeting our coffee farmers, but also giving shoes. Um, so every, every year I get to do a couple of these trips, and it's a great way for me to reconnect with the original intent that I spoke about before, um, because there's nothing like actually being there and placing a shoe on a kid's foot and seeing their smile, seeing their parents being excited and playing with them. and just you, you, you forget about all the stress and all the stupid stuff we worry about in our regular lives when you're out in the field and serving in that way. And so um, those trips are really important for me. Uh, they're a, a really important for my wife too. She comes on many of them. Sometimes she goes on them without me. My parents go on them. You know, all the Tom staff members, we pay for them to go on them every other year. So that's a big investment for us, but one that we see is so important. So they get to see the the, the, the work that's happening, no matter if they work in accounting or design or giving or whatnot. So that's the way that I really stay connected uh, to, to the people that we're serving. Okay, okay. Well, um, we're going to open up for audience questions now. If you have a question for Tom, just raise your hand. And um, someone from the Apple team, hooray, lots of people. We're going we're gonna, to start, we'll just pass along each. Someone's going to give you a microphone. Rosie, just here. Will right you put your hand up again? Yeah, three. Put your hand up again. Let's start with the gentleman. Hello, uh, my name is Kuti. I started a footwear company last year through crowdfunding, and I wanted to ask, how is it for you to, at, in the early stages, to build a team? Mm. And obviously you had a story, but like, in terms of getting people to believe in you and to be as dedicated to you as, he, as you were, yeah. how did you manage to do that? Great, good so question. good question, and congratulations on starting your footwear business. Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing is, as quickly as you can, um, take it from being your story to our story. You know, um, I was very fortunate in the very early days that I had a group of um, very passionate interns uh, that you know were working at local or, or studying at local universities, were looking for a summer internship, 
Um, you know, they were not going to be able to get paid because we didn't have the budget for that initially, but they knew that they would get to work, you know, directly with me, they'd get to learn, and they'd get to really be part of the, of the creation of this, this, this idea. And I think that, you know, I always say to entrepreneurs, interns are fantastic because A, you're no longer lonely because you got a bunch of people around you, and B, you know, they kind of help, they, they, they start to own the experience and, and the initiative as well. And then they're also more storytellers. So I think the first thing is to take it from your story to our story, and then it becomes more powerful and there's more uh, kind of momentum around it. And I think really good internships for young companies are the best ones because you get so much more responsibility and you get to do so much more. Absolutely. That's the best bit. Yeah. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm not from the business part at all. I'm a, I have actually a master's in healthcare. And I'm actually, I just moved here from New York and I won't be working for the next two to three years, just enjoying and traveling. Is there any way that I could volunteer, help out? Mm using my master's in healthcare because I know I it's always nice to give back and that's what that's why I was in the profession anyways. That's great. Well, it's very very nice of you to offer. Um, you know, the the best way to volunteer is really with our giving partners because I, as I discussed earlier, the giving partners are really the the last mile of the process. They're the ones that are actually getting the shoes onto the children's feet or working in the eye camps. So, you know, we, we still go on trips and we take, you know, kind of um, our, our, our employees or sometimes vendors or we do contests where people can win. But, but, but most of the giving happens 365 days a year with our giving partners. So one way would be to go onto the Tom's website and to research different giving partners and then depending on where you would like to volunteer to talk to the giving partner directly because that's the best way to volunteer. Great, thank you. Uh, hi there. Um, I read your book about a year ago and amazing, phenomenal. And um, for the last year I've been sort of designing my own business, a uh, business called Wupika. Great. Um, we're a teddy bear business. Oh, cool. And every bear we sell, we're going to feed a hungry child for a whole year, school year for Fantastic. a great charity called Mary's Mills. Um, and I know you've just launched, well, about a year ago, a couple of years ago, you launched the Marketplace over yes. in the US. Yes. Um, I saw some really cool companies on that. Is there any sort of like a couple of really great companies that you're really excited about and you sort of share their story? Um, and if I can also be really cheeky and who can I talk to to get on that sure. Marketplace? Yeah, yeah. so uh, the lady in the green hat in the far side here, uh, would be the person to talk to afterwards about the marketplace, so that's great. Um, for those of you who don't know, the marketplace is this concept that we want to, as we grow, we also want to help other young social entrepreneurs grow as well. So I'm personally making a lot of investments in social entrepreneurs now, um, but also Tom's as a company is putting them on a digital platform on toms.com so we can share other people's stories and the work that they're doing. Um, so there's a lot of social entrepreneurs and sounds like your business would be a great fit for that. So they can talk to Ali on that. Um, and what was the first part of the question? Sorry, I got on the marketplace. Um, about the other, other businesses that you, you Oh yeah, really so inspiring? a couple of exciting ones. Um, you know, I think one of my favorite ones is this one called Join, J-O-Y-N. Uh, it's a, a girl from the United States that moved to India, and she works with the most ostracized um, people in India, lepers and, and people who have no uh, ability to get any gainful employment at all. She takes them and she teaches them block printing techniques, and she creates beautiful fabrics that then become bags. We've actually made some shoes out of her fabrics, um, but she has an amazing line of bags and different stuff that's on the marketplace. Uh, her name is Melody, and she's a, and she's really an amazing woman. Um, and her company Join is one to look at in the marketplace um, that I specifically like a lot. So, great. Thank you. Okay. In the can back. You, um, can you just pass the microphone backwards? Hi, I'm Willa. I'm from Amsterdam, and I started my own uh, communication agency in sustainable fashion and lifestyle about four or five years ago. And I was wondering, um, since I work with a lot of brands who um, feel that it's very difficult to monitor their production process. I mm. was wondering how, as if Tom's, I mean, we know all about the front end, and sure. of course, I also read about the, the back end a little yeah. bit, but maybe you can explain a little bit how you manage to monitor the production process of Tom's products. Sure, so, you know, really, we look at using third parties mainly. 
Um, so different firms that we hire to do announced and unannounced audits. Uh, we also have an interior internal team that has that responsibility as their day job as well. The thing that's really challenging from a production standpoint is not necessarily monitoring the factories where your products are made, but the actual suppliers. That's the thing that I didn't understand when I first got in this business. I thought, you know, okay, if we monitor the factories, we have a, a code of conduct that every factory signs, you know, that that was enough. But what we found in the, in, the, in the most recent years is you really have to go all the way down to the supplier level. That is much easier for us to do now because we're making tens of millions of shoes a year. So we have purchasing power. So we can put our leverage of purchasing power to make sure suppliers follow our code of conduct. But as you're saying, with a lot of new brands that are starting out, it's very, very difficult. I wish I had like a great answer for that in terms of what to do, because it's something we struggled with too. So, you know, the, 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 so it's a very thing, hard thing when you're first getting started. Wouldn't it be interesting to do something along the lines of marketplace and then in sourcing, you know, opening up those sources and mm -hmm. becoming more transparent for other smaller companies to also start producing um, in a good way. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have time for like one or two more. One at the front, please. Thank you. Thanks. You've achieved so much in nine years. Um, I just wanted to know where you see Tom's in the next 10 years, how the company will grow. Mm, man. Um, you know, it's like... I was going to ask that, but I was too scared because I was like, he's done so much already, I can't ask like, what's next. Um, we talk about Tom's years like dog years, like one year seems like so much happens. Um, so it's really hard to think 10 years out. Um, yeah, I have trouble thinking 10 months out sometimes. But I think that overall, I mean, you know, I think what, what, what my vision has, has, has evolved into is Tom's to not only be an organization that is creating great products that people love and enjoy every day that can make a difference in people's lives, but Tom's to be a leader in, in really the movement of social business and to be an organization that whether it's celebrating other social entrepreneurs through marketplace or creating community outposts like we're opening in London today where people can come and have dialogue and discussions about this, learn about new businesses maybe such as yourselves, you know, that's I think what my kind of dream for Tom's is, is really to play a role in the future of business and in culture as much as in creating the products. And so that might lead us into content. It might lead us into entertainment. It might lead us into, you know, things like hospitality. I mean, one of the things that I've, I've often thought it would be amazing is to have a, a series of Tom's hotels where every night you stay in a room at a Tom's hotel, we take a homeless person off the street. Done, yeah, deal, yeah, right? do it, do it. That's so, a great right? idea. It'd be amazing. I think if you it went It doesn't to, have to be a five-star hotel, no, like a, like a like hostel a, for everyone. Yeah, I think just a cool, you know, simple uh, space and how great, you, I, I always say it'd be the best night's sleep you've ever had because you know that you're helping someone else at the same time. So it's things like that that we're talking about and thinking about, but um, you know, I'm young, I'm 38. I have a lot of years, hopefully, to do this, so, uh, so we'll, we'll keep going. I have one thing to say. Yeah. I watched a video where all these kids had just been given Tom's shoes and they were so happy and they were playing football, yeah. but the football was a plastic bag yes. with earth inside. Yes. And I thought that is so sad that children don't even have access to a ball if you think what joy yeah. football does for a community. Yeah. So maybe somehow you can incorporate footballs into what you do with sports shoes or something because it broke my heart. Yeah, actually on the marketplace there's a great uh, football company. Okay, good. Yeah, and it's a buy a ball, give a ball. Okay, and buy a ball everyone, yeah, seriously. It's we really know cool. what football does for communities, for women and men. It's so important. It's just a ball. Yeah, and well, it, well play is so important. I mean, you know, I mean, in, in many of these places, uh, you know, life is really tough. And, and, and kids being able to play in a dream, and, and that is such an important thing. And football is the universal sport. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we love to do when we go on the giving trips is after we distribute the shoes, we almost always play football. So it's, I'm not very good, but it's a lot of fun. Okay, great. And I have one last question I'm going to have to close. Um, who, who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? You know, there's, I mean, I, I've, I've had the great pleasure, I think, and, and, and privilege, really, through Tom's, uh, to get to meet all kinds of amazing people doing amazing things, whether it's you know you know marketplace founders or it's you know different people that we work with in some of the local factories, uh, to people who maybe are you know more well known. I, I think that 
you know, uh, I guess it was last year I had the opportunity to meet a, a hero that I, I had always looked up to named uh, Muhammad Yunus. And if you don't know who Professor Yunus is, he started the Grameen Bank. And the Grameen Bank was really the first of its kind to uh, give loans to the poorest of the poor. And what Muhammad Yunus learned was if you create a, a loan structure through community lending to the poorest of the poor, they will actually repay the loans better than all of us repay our loans here in this audience, which is hard to believe. Um, but so, so Muhammad Yunus showed that it could be profitable he could actually create a for-profit business helping the poorest of the poor get loans they desperately need to create businesses of their own. And as an entrepreneur myself, that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And it's, it's largely women, uh, and, 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 and it's usually loans of under $30. But with that, they can either start a candle business or cheese business or you know dairy or all these different things and then sometimes they lead to bigger enterprises and and it's it's always just such an exciting thing when I am in these communities and I see a microcredit or microfinance program many times you know started or inspired by the Grameen Bank and Professor Yunus and and I see how powerful that is in changing someone's life because it allows oftentimes many women to take control of their destiny and their future and then they get more respect in the community and then when women get more respect in the community then more girls go to school when more girls go to school everything is better and so it really uh, you know there's a great video called the girl effect I'm, I'm sure you've seen it if you haven't you know as soon as you're done listening to this watch the girl effect video it's a very good explanation of how powerful it is when we invest in girls in developing countries and so Muhammad Yunus has done an amazing job in that um, I'm actually working with Muhammad Yunus on some ideas that maybe we can incorporate into Tom's for the future, but he's something I really look up to. Okay, great. Great. Okay, we have to end there. I could go on forever great. and ever. Thank Kinvara, you so thank much. Thank you very Clay much. Kosky, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was great.